Hi, everyone. This is Dave from Valley Fever Survivor. We are about to be starting the new Valley Fever Survivor teleconference. Hi. I'm so glad that so many of you have decided that you wanted to come and listen to what we had to say today. We will have everybody muted until the end, which is where we will open everything up for questions. And to begin with, Basically, I want to just welcome everyone to our third Valentina Survivor Teleconference. We've done this twice before. Some of the topics today will be on the organism that causes valley fever, my personal VF story, new developments in research, info on fluconazole, reason why VF drugs can cause problems at airport security. Some of you may have remembered seeing somebody write about that recently discussion about some food, and a question and answer session. And we'll try to take as many questions at the end as possible. So I'm going to start off with a little background about Valley Fever Survivor. Many of you are not familiar with what we've been doing. When I contracted Valley Fever in 2001, There were no articles about this disease in the news, much less anyone speaking out loud or writing the words valley fever. One prominent valley fever doctor even referred to the disease as a local secret. With David's dedicated research into peer-reviewed medical journals, he saw the disease was far more severe than even the few researchers publicly acknowledged. We knew it was time to create an organization to tell the whole story and warn the public that this incurable disease existed. David and I acted on this urgent public need by creating Valley Fever Survivor as an all-volunteer organization in 2002, at a time when word of the epidemic was kept silent nationwide, we coined Valley Fever Survivor and made it our organization's official name. From that day forward, people have learned that whenever they see or hear Valley Fever Survivor, it represents the work of Sharon and David Philippe, and they can count on the information provided to the general public. That is why we made Valley Fever Survivor a federally registered trademark. Of course, information may change from time to time, so we are always ready and willing to update for the latest information available. Valley Fever Survival was the first to publish the dangers of Valley Fever people from coast to coast and around the world. All too often, Valley Fever was dishonestly portrayed as a minor problem that only affected the local areas where the fungus grew. To combat this, Valley Fever Survivor put a focus on the important facts, the global ramifications, and try to get the media interested in the severity of the disease. Who would believe that a bioterrorist weapon regulated by two anti-terrorism laws for 16 years would be kept a local secret in major American cities and tourist destinations? Who would believe it grows naturally in the ground, becomes airborne, and infects hundreds of thousands of people and animals every year? That is exactly what was happening then and is still happening today. Valley Fever Survivor seeks to end the chronic misinformation and misperceptions. Improper information was wrongly used as grounds to remove coccidioitis from the CDC selectation list. It should rightfully be returned there to continue beyond the 16 years of regulations in the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996 and the Public Health Security and Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Act of 2002. That was a mouthful. Valley Fever Survivor is proud to have been the hub of the worldwide Valley Fever community since its inception in 2002. Our ongoing nearly 24-7 volunteer work with research and support has become legendary in the Valley Fever community. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. Hi, with so many new people here, it is worth reviewing exactly what kind of organism valley fever survivor or valley fever is and exactly why it is so serious. A critical part of understanding it is to know the valley fever life cycle. Cassidioides, the organism that causes valley fever, starts out in the ground as a soil mycelia 
these are fibrous strands that are in the soil, and it's, in fact, mycelia that give cheese its rigidity. So these are relatively strong structures of fiber. But when disturbed by the wind, construction, footsteps, even earthquakes, like the outbreak during the Northridge earthquake in California, there's some seed-like spores that can break off from these strands. Those are called arthrocnidia. And when these break off, they can go into the air. Sometimes they're mixed with dust. When you see dust in the air, you know that the wind is blowing. But it could even be a bright, simple, sunny day, and these spores could be free-floating. They could even travel up to 500 miles from the area of original growth of the fungus. And what happens is if someone were to breathe in these spores, in 72 hours, they transform into spherules. They're ball-like structures that are actually parasitic within the human and animal body. Sometimes the metaphor is like Pac-Man because that's ball-like, but in actuality it doesn't have teeth and it does not chew on people, but it is a true, genuine parasite because it releases hormones and chemicals that consume and destroy living tissue within a host. Then within 24 to 48 hours, these parasitic spherules can reach maturity and break open, almost like a piggy bank full of coins. What they're growing inside them are a bunch of tiny other sphere-shaped objects that are known as endospores. And valley fever spherules are nothing so helpful as money from a piggy bank. When the spherules are growing 200 to 1,000 tiny copies of themselves as endospores, that is a major threat to your health. The endospores can grow up to become spherules and repeat the cycle, meaning coxie can replicate itself thousands of times over in a number of days. And this is part of why it's so serious. Often when valley fever is discussed in terms of a patient's immune status, if a patient is immunocompromised, it's often assumed that it's only the damage to the immune system that allows valley fever to take hold. But really, no one knows how many spores are inhaled in a given breath. Fifteen trillion spores could fit into a cubic inch. And now you know that there could be thousands of times that many spores inside a healthy person who inhales those spores in just a matter of days, simply because of how it replicates within the body. And this is why 45% of a Navy SEAL squad fell ill when training in Coalinga, California, even though Navy SEALs are notoriously the healthiest, hardiest people among us. It's not just a matter of how well your immune system works, but how many spores you inhale. No one can see the microscopic spores, even by the millions, to know how much of a megadose they might have received with any given breath. And with the speed of this disease's replication, it can overcome even the healthiest immune system. In fact, my mother Sharon was completely healthy before her valley fever case. And you should hear a little bit more about her valley fever story. I'll try to make this short, but give you an idea of what my case of valley fever was like. I contracted valley fever in October 2001 after being in Arizona to help one of my children settle in to attend the university. I decided to look at new home areas in Tucson thinking it would be a nice idea to possibly move to a sunny and warm climate. Never heard from anyone there about this disease, so walking in the wind with dust being stirred up was not thought to be a concern. I stayed in Tucson longer than expected due to the September 11, 2001 terror attacks on our country. I delayed my trip back home for a while, but it was important to return with the seasons changing. Once home, I decided to do a lot of yard work to take my mind off the insanity of what happened to so many people in New York, Washington, D.C., and Pennsylvania. One week after arriving home, I became extremely ill. I had trouble breathing and immediately became bedridden. Usually I avoid doctors, but I felt I had no choice but to see one. After looking at my chest x-ray, my doctor informed me that he thought I had a typical case of bacterial pneumonia. In fact, one of the worst cases he's ever seen. I was placed on antibiotics, just like most of you, and I continued to get worse. Wrong thing to do, as most of you do know. My initial doctor wanted me to go to the hospital, and I refused. Instead, I was sent to a pulmonary doctor. He performed bronchoscopy, hoping to identify the cause of what I literally seemed to be dying from. When I could barely breathe, my head was in excruciating pain because my brain was pulsating as if trying to come out of my skull, and my wheezing sounded like the death rattle, 
I truly believed I was dying. I told my husband that I probably went to the doctor too late to be helped and that I would rather die at home rather than in a hospital. To my surprise, I lived. Many people have headaches with valley fever, but I had a severe head pain. That pain never eased at all, all day long and all night long. Tears would stream down my face involuntarily. It felt as I decided, as I described it, it was to the doctor as if my brain was pulsating, enlarging, and trying to push its way out of my skull, but my skull wouldn't let it leave. After reading about meningitis at that time and considering my 1 to 64 titer, I believe I was one of the few victims of valley fever to survive its disseminated meningitis without medication. An awful lot of pain, misery, and time had elapsed. Many chest x-rays later, and I just started to show some improvement. My pulmonary doctor was afraid to stop me on any of the fungicides used in coccidial or the mycosis treatment. In fact, he thought the drugs might cause my death rather than get me well. He told me, and I'll quote, you survived this on your own. We didn't do a damn thing to help you, unquote. He obviously wanted to, but it just didn't work out that way. Fast forward to 2018, and I'm very happy to report I'm doing quite well in spite of all the scarring in my lungs and my severe initial bone and other pains. My goal has been not only to warn and alert others about the dangers of valley fever, but also to help other valley fever survivors get their lives back or become healthier due to their food choices and a healthy lifestyle. So now that you know a little bit about where we came from to start Valley Fever Survivor. I'm going to turn this back to Dave, and he's going to talk about some of the new developments. In the online world of our Valley Fever Survivor support group, everyone wants to have a cure. The proposed cure for Valley Fever is Nicomycin Z, a compound that has been bounced from one pharmaceutical company to another since the 1970s. Now it is in the hands of the University of Arizona and Valley Fever Solutions. The current Phase 2A trials that are expected for late 2008 may be able to build the credibility by the end of next year to enable another $2 million in FDA orphan drug grants for 2019. Although $40 million are expected to be needed to bring the drug to market, actually being able to acquire any grants and showing proof of concept are critical, and that is what the next two years have in store for Nicomycin Z's ongoing research as planned. But with the proposed cure so far into the horizon, other drugs and research are poised to take center stage. Enzymes are compounds that enable specific chemical reactions. When pharmaceutical companies are making drugs to fight against infections, one approach is to block or reduce the availability of those enzymes so the infectious organism can have severe problems, and hopefully the patient doesn't get those same problems from the drugs. Viamet Pharmaceuticals was a company that had been working on the discovery of useful metalloenzymes. The closer a company can drill down on specific fungus-focused enzyme activities to stop the fungal infection, the more they can damage the health of the fungus while protecting the health of the human. So drugs like fluconazole that are available today inhibit the fungal P450 enzyme. It's uh, much less sensitive to fluconazole in people than the fungi, although people still get the side effects. Blocking P450 prevents the production of specific hormones that build the fungal cell walls. And even if the fungus doesn't outright make its uh, growth stop, it's more difficult for the fungus. That's why many valley fever drugs are called fungus static rather than fungicidal. It sort of stops the fungi in place so the immune system can take over, hopefully. Although this process still interferes with some aspects of human health, and many patients with the side effects from the current antifungal drug will attest to that. The liver-focused consequences are often severe for the people who take the drugs. But with the new Viamet technology focusing on fungal CYP51, that's a totally different enzyme. Viamet discovered how to fight it in fungi with their new metalloenzyme detection technology and developed it into the new drug VT1167. I'm sure the name will change as it gets closer to release because a bunch of numbers are not necessarily going to be what they will market it as. 
But by being so selective about the enzyme the drug can attack within the fungus, it is likely to cause fewer side effects in people and animals. Previous testing in dogs has shown it to be effective in much, much lower doses than expected. Further, even oh, <clears throat> excuse me, further, this is also a drug that can even be used against candida, which is thought to be a much larger target market, and that is likely to be much more of a moneymaker for the company, so they will want to promote it much more than if it were simply produced for one disease and one disease only, like valley fever. Viamet was recently purchased by NovaQuest Capital. This does not mean their work will stop. Salinity Therapeutics has been formed to develop this and other aspects of Viamet group of companies from when Viamet was purchased. So we have every expectation that the drugs will continue and their development will move beyond their current phase two trial. In less than a decade, there may be a much more effective, much less toxic antifungal drug option from VT1161. Also on the horizon, coming up in October 2018, there is going to be new information released in the medical journal Colloids and Surfaces Biointerfaces. But the preliminary information about it already is pretty exciting and will be even better when we probably have the complete story. To enable rapid and accurate detection of valley fever, scientists have developed a graphene-based biosensor produced from microprinting. Many of you are familiar with 3D printers and know that they can produce anything from firearm parts to medical prosthetics. But this particular microcontact printing technique is different because it involves graphene oxide. Graphene is exciting. It is a special conductive structure that is only a single molecule thick. By being so small, lightweight, and still able to conduct electricity, it can be combined with other products easily to create sensors for various purposes, including detection of the immune response. If this particular one can be used to detect valley fever antibodies, as the upcoming study is expected to reveal, that is an incredible step to make much more reliable, cheap, and instantaneous diagnosis. It's a very exciting development and one I definitely look forward to for easier diagnosis for valley fever. As you can tell, Dave's excited about the possibilities going forward. Uh, I have something that I want to say about fluconazole. Most people are now aware of the most common side effects, which are dizziness, diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, headaches, skin rashes, and elevated liver enzymes. Less common uh, or known are the anorexia. Of course, fatigue we know is a big thing, even though they don't think of it as that. Constipation, hair loss lowered white blood cell count, seizures, muscle spasm, nervousness, sexual dysfunction, vertigo, indigestion, vision problems, and even bleeding between periods for women. It is possible that patients will experience ser serious liver side effects from taking fluconazole, which is why you constantly have your liver being monitored. There is a big risk for anyone with current liver problems or liver damage. A history of liver problems and people with underlying conditions, including cancer and HIV. Fulconazole may cause liver cell death, hepatitis, jaundice, and liver failure. It's vital that your liver be constantly monitored by your doctor. But another major side effect is during pregnancy. There is a lot of conflicting information about fulconazole and pregnancy. And I'd like to actually give an exact quote from an organization called Recall Report. And it states as follows. As if all the previous side effects were not troubling enough, fluconazole has recently been found to cause birth defects and miscarriages. Since the drug came on the market in 1990, Millions of women and their babies were exposed to this risk without warning. The first official warning only came in 2011 from the FDA when the agency upgraded the pregnancy class of higher doses of fluconazole from C to D, a classification that communicates this drug is known to cause harm to human fetuses. The warning and class change came on the heels of a study that uncovered the disturbing fact 
the doses between 400 and 800 milligrams of fluconazole, which we all know everybody's on, cause specific birth defects when women use the drug at these doses over the long term during pregnancy. These defects include cleft lip, cleft palate, bone defects including bowed thigh bones, abnormal shaping of the face and skull cap, a head that is too broad and short, muscle weakness, and congenital heart defects. These are terrible things just to even say the words. We also now know that these pregnancy side effects do not stop at large doses of fluconazole, which is one of the reasons why I want everybody to hear this. Another more recent study found that women using doses at 150 milligrams to treat vaginal yeast infections were at a significantly greater risk of having a miscarriage when compared to women using another type of antifungal medication. The FDA issued a safety warning about low doses and miscarriages in early 2016, but made no moves yet to reclassify 150 milligram fluconazole dosages with this information. The agency got the information out to the public, but stated that it would spend more time going over the results of the study and doing its own analysis before making a decision about what to do next. Did any of you ever hear this report from the FDA? I never did, and I doubt if any of you did either. To continue, currently the FDA recommends that doctors take great care in prescribing fluconazole to pregnant women or women who may become pregnant and to report any adverse events to the agency for further study. To me, if you already know there's a problem, tell people in advance. If you know anyone living in the endemic zones or outside the endemic zones that plan on being in an endemic zone, please share this information with them. And now Dave has something really interesting that you'll be the first people to ever hear this anywhere in the world. So Dave, here's the phone. Okay, uh, this is a perhaps considered an explosive announcement about Valley Fever drugs. Travel isn't fun, and even if you're not traveling to a Valley Fever danger zone, you can have some problems. Since 9-11, American travelers dealt with the indignity of shoe removal, security scanners that take naked pictures, selective screening of elderly women walking with canes, and young babies who've been placed on the national terrorism watch list. Maybe crying is a form of terrorism, but for those of you wondering if there's a new special indignity just for valley fever patients at the airport, you might want to hear about the chemical structure of your antifungal drugs. It's interesting that there was a post about it just this week in the Valley Fever Survivor Support Group. You may not expect the chemical structure of a drug to have real-world effects when you're at the airport, but this can. Fluconazole, posaconazole, itraconazole, and other drugs that treat valley fever are called triazoles due to their chemical structure. They have three nitrogen atoms linked together in a way that is not necessarily stable. In fact, according to the second edition of the textbook Organic Chemistry, this instability has an unexpected problem. Drugs like the pills used to treat valley fever are potentially explosive because they can suddenly give off stable gaseous nitrogen. So just as nitrogen fertilizer has been used as an explosive, it is theoretically possible that diflucan and other antifungal drugs could as well at least to a very tiny degree. This is not to the point where Pfizer Pharmaceuticals would even consider it a fire or explosion hazard on its safety material data warning. But the loss of nitrogen atoms is possible. Do pharmacies take any unique precautions with these drugs compared to other drugs? At the CDC's NIOSH list, which focuses on occupational health safety, it looks at the risk of birth defects with these drugs, but it has nothing to do with flammability in any of their warning labels. So what might we expect about this chemistry trivia that nitrogen molecules can just pop off at any moment? Drugs are often excreted through the skin. The way that these drugs can potentially lose nitrogen might be with setting off explosive detectors in airports. This caused at least two of our support group members the hassle of extended security searches and being the people who are taken out of the security line 
to the annoyance of a separate security room and to be tested there for what appeared to be explosives according to airport security. The skin is an organ that helps detoxify the body by excreting sweat and other compounds. So it is not surprising at all if antifungal drugs could be detected on the skin as well, causing this airport security nightmare. There's another possibility. Perhaps what is happening here is similar to binary weapons in the military. A binary weapon is a combination of two chemicals, where each chemical is completely safe on its own, but together the chemicals make a toxin or an explosive. With the infinite combinations of drugs and food additives available in the world, it is, pos it is just impossible. There's no way to track or predict the combinations that might interact with unexpected results. Perhaps the release of even more nitrogen from fluconazole might be such a result of that kind of interaction. This is not something common to thousands of people with valley fever, but if you happen to be pulled out of the security line, it is at least worthwhile to ask why. If the answer is that their chemical detectors think you've been handling explosives, maybe your antifungal prescription is to blame. That's an explosive side effect you are not likely to read about, but is an unfortunate fact or possibility. That was a shocker to both of us. Really, really shocking to hear that. The next subject matter that I want you to get into was about food for health. We all know that valley fever uh, doesn't care whether you're young or old, whether you're healthy or have other ailments. It's an opportunistic disease. With that said, uh, but the, there are a lot of things. And when I was doing so badly, Dave decided that he needed to start doing some research. And that's how we became pioneers into researching the pharmacology of valley fever with foods and what supplements might help. So with that, I thought I would uh, talk a little bit about what we're talking about should have five to seven servings of vegetables a day. In our files tab on the support group is where we have information on basic foods to eat. But there's so many choices in vegetables that I thought I, I'd give a, a, a listing here so that people would understand that it's not just one or two things and how they can make their food choices maybe a little different. There are top vegetable choices like broccoli, spinach, kale, artichoke, asparagus, and cauliflower, which uh, are great for elevating the, your glutathione level in your body, uh, as this is critical for many critical health purposes. But they assist in the detoxifying of your liver as well. And when, t especially if you're on antifungal drugs, you really want to make sure that your liver is working okay. But some of the other things you can add to make things real interesting would be doing your own sprouting. Now, we have a video on sprouting. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Valley Fever Survivor, and there are many different educational and inspirational videos there, as well as one on sprouting. The sprouting one happens to be actually an audio done uh, as a video, but one day, hopefully, we'll be able to get to do it so you can actually see the process. But Dave explains it really well. It's very inexpensive, and it's probably one of the best health foods you can eat are sprouts. So broccoli sprouts, which is real easy and super, super cheap, you get a ton of broccoli sprouts for pennies. And it doesn't taste anything like the vegetable itself. So for people that hate broccoli, one thing has nothing to do with the other. The sprouts don't taste anything like broccoli. And with broccoli sprouts, the most important thing out of broccoli sprouts is sephorophane. Sephorophane is the chemical that helps prevent cancers, also helps uh, people that do have cancer. And a half a cup of broccoli sprouts is the equivalent to eating about 50 pounds of broccoli. So who could eat 50 pounds of broccoli? No one I know. So in the end, 
Barclay Sprouts can give you, you can see a tremendous benefit in just a half a cup. And you could add it to soup, put it on sandwiches, you could um, put it on salads. Uh, there's a ton of ways to utilize it. And once made, it just stays on your countertop in a little jar. And once it's uh, three days old, sprouting it is enough. You put it in the refrigerator and uh, in a container, steel container, and you have it for quite a while to use for yourself and your family. And I will tell you that once you start eating something like this, it changes how you feel internally. Your health will dramatically improve, even if that's the only sprouts you do is broccoli sprouts. I can't begin to tell you what a major overhaul it could have in how well you feel. Now, other vegetables that are really great to add would be watercress, peppers, preferably red, orange, and yellow, so you get all the different uh, phytonutrients, cabbages, especially red, uh, arugula, bok choy, red leaf lettuce, butter lettuce, romaine lettuce, collard greens, eggplant, uh, red onions over the other onions, uh, zucchini, cucumbers, tomatoes, endives, mushrooms, and especially reishi, shiitake, maitake, cordyceps, and chaga varieties offer the greatest benefits. But if you don't ever want to eat mushrooms, you don't have to because there are plenty of other things you could eat. Beet greens are excellent. Broccoli flour, Brussels sprouts, celery chard, cilantro, cucumber, dandelion, fennel. This, you know, and the list goes on and on. So there are just so many different things you could have. Green beans, you know, uh, with that as well. Leeks, kohlrabi, mustard greens, parsley, spaghetti squash, all the different types of squashes. So there are lots of choices you have. It's not something boring. You can even eat fermented vegetables like kimchi, fermented sauerkraut. I wouldn't eat sauerkraut unless it was fermented because you're not getting nothing, no benefits from it. You can get a lot of benefits. There are a lot of probiotics and prebiotics in fermented foods that are really excellent. And then there are things like the people say, well, what am I going to eat? Well, if you like beans, there are many different types of beans you could have, like black beans, lentil beans, azuki beans, red kidney beans, cannelloni beans. There are a lot of which are also known as white kidney beans. There are a lot of those that you could have. And you could add various spices to it, which even assist your digestion, like turmeric, ginger, fennel, cardamom, anise, Celery seeds are good for the digestion. So there's a lot of different things that you can do to help yourself. And when you look for any cans that you want to buy that have a can, rather than making your own beans, make sure that that is the only thing in there and the cans are BPA-free, and you can do that. David has been doing some utterly fantastic foods for us using garbanzo beans which are also known as chickpeas. And we have learned ways to use that to avoid mayonnaise. So you can make an egg salad using garbanzo bean and eggs. And it's utterly fantastic. So there are a lot of different things you can do that you wouldn't normally think about. In fact, I've been talking to him. I want him to write this book because there is, he's done every kind of hummus that you can imagine, many different hummus breads. And he has so many of them that some of them are like dessert. And so we hope to get him to write that. We're all trying to get him to do that in our household because it's really excellent food. It's good for you. It gives you fiber. It gives you protein. It gives you carbs. It gives you everything you need. Now, we talk about also having nuts because you need a lot of stuff the good fats for your brain. Your brain is mostly made of fat, and if you don't give it the fats, you get brain fog. And lots of people valley fever have brain fog. So with that, we do pistachios, almonds, walnuts, flax seeds, pecans, and one of my other son's favorite, cashews. And you can do a lot with that. 
as snacks or putting it on salads, putting it in soups, any which way you want it, you really can help your brain. And the other food that's really great for your brain are avocados. Avocados are one of the best brain food in the world. So I highly recommend everybody have at least a half an avocado a day if possible. Now, there are other things that help with fibers like chia seed and flaxseed meal and things of that nature. So your intake of fiber is vital, really, really important. We also have done in the past some individualized food plans for people But for that, we had to charge money because it takes us about 40 hours of time to put it all together. But by giving you the basic information, you should be able to help yourselves do this. And, of course, eating fish and chicken is fine as well for if you don't always want to eat beans and things of that nature. But avoiding red meat is better for you than not. Having no more than like three ounces a week of red meat is good. They know from various studies that red meat tends to cause cancer, and then the only meat you should have, if you're going to have it, should be those that are grass-fed beef. It's not cheap to buy organic meats. But for proteins, you can have things like eggs, faja yogurt, which is 0% fat, and so everything in there is natural, nothing else added. I'm talking about the plain one, and it's really tasty. So you could have that, but if you're on fluconazole, you have to watch to have it like two hours after you take your drugs. And there isn't any food out there that once you're on medication, you need to look everything up. You don't take, just because it could be good for you, it may not be good for you depending on the drugs you're on. So always be careful about any foods you add to your diet or things you change. You need to find out if there are contraindications. Of course, lean turkey is another uh, choice. Salmon, halibut, sea bass, tilapia are all fishes that would be good to have if you like to have fish. And, of course, in our list we also discover, discuss the berries. A lot of people like to make wraps. And basically we don't have any bread use or anything like that initially because what we want you to do is to do everything possible to avoid any kind of sugars and anything you can do as best as possible. And all breads contain sugar. Spaghetti contains sugar. It turns the sugar in the body. So you, you want to try to avoid all that. You've got to be really, really strict. If you want to really knock this down, you have to be very, I'll, get, I'll say the word conservative, you know, not, not take chances. Not to say, well, a little bit won't hurt because a little bit does hurt. But eventually you will be able to have two different types of wraps. And I don't recommend most of the wraps out there because there's very little fiber in there, they're high in carbs, and they don't do anything for your health. But there are two that we found, and I'll give you the names of both of them. One is the Mission Carb Balance. The large tortillas have 26 grams of fibers in each one an unbelievable number. The only thing I don't like about it is it has sucralose in it. So that's something to think about in relation to everything else. But otherwise, that's a fantastic way to get 26 grams of fiber right off the bat in one. And you should get between 30 and 40 grams of fiber every day, especially if you're on any of the antifungals. The other one is the La Tortilla Factory Smart and Delicious Low Carb High Fiber. They have 12 grams of fiber in each one. So either one of those, if you're into wraps, not just doing a lettuce wrap, that is something to consider. And, of course, the berries, you all have seen that on the berries of what we recommend with blackberries, strawberries, blueberries, and raspberries to be the only possible fruit that you eat in the beginning. Once your beard goes dormant, you can add a lot of different things. So we also do a lot of combining of uh, smoothies with freeze-dried powders, and I won't take the time to go in it into it now because we've already been talking for 40 minutes straight, and I'd like to get to your questions if you have any. But within hopefully a week, two weeks at the utmost, 
we will have our brand new Valley Survivor website up. It is just utterly fantastic. And when everybody sees it, I know everybody will appreciate it. There's going to be so much stuff there and helpful stuff. And it's going to look good. It's going to be easy to, to navigate and easy to find everything. So we'll let you know as soon as it's available. We're going to have an, a section there which will be about all the foods and all the supplements that we have used and things that we know are very positive for the immune system. But like I said, everything has to go against what medications are you on, what is your health condition as to whether it will be proper for you to take. So that all will be there for everybody to see and check out within a week or two the most. So with that said, I'd just like to remind everybody that we do have a YouTube channel so they can check out videos. And we'll even have services available to people that you may find interesting and may be interested in. So with that, I'm going to have David talk to you about how to do the Q&A. Hopefully, we'll be able to talk with many of you. Okay. Now, what should be happening is that I should be able to set up a Q&A session. For those of you who are uh, not muted and just checking in to make sure that the conference is still going, can I just have confirmation that people can still hear us? Yes. I okay, can hear excellent. you. Yes. Okay, this is good. Now what happens is most of these phone numbers will be muted. However, if anyone would like to ask a question, you can press pound six, and it should add you to the Q&A list and then I'll be able to answer questions in the order that they are received in the list. So if you'd like to have some questions to ask, then you can start pressing pound six now. Okay, so I have uh, one in the list, and others can keep adding to uh, just click pound six if you want to ask a question. I will get this first one now. Hello. What kinds of things can a person expect when being put on or taken off fluconazole? Um, they're trying it for my husband for the second time. First time was not successful. He got worse very quickly. Okay, and the way that he would have gotten worse would not have been directly from valley fever. It would have been from the fluconazole side effects. But am I clear that the, what you are asking is what to expect when being taken off of the fluconazole? Yes, he just had a visit with the doctor on Thursday, I believe it was, and and they're trying it for the second time. Okay, when being removed from fluconazole, if, if the disease is in fact progressing, the fungal disease, valley fever, then they might find higher titers, they might find additional symptoms, they might find the symptoms to be more severe. However, if he does not need the drug, and if the problems are from the drugs, almost all of them would be detected as liver problems. That is the most common fluconazole concern. And that they would be checking liver enzymes, or that your doctors at least should be checking liver enzymes to understand exactly what is uh, going on with that, if that's a major concern from the problems of fluconazole. Yes, and that was one of the concerns. But he was also taking ibuprofen for the pain. And it could be that that is a contributor to the liver enzymes. It could be that even the ibuprofen, depending on how his body is tolerating fluconazole, the ibuprofen could be causing all of the problems. Yeah, so it's definitely any... worth talking to your doctor about what does he think the share are of problems and has it been tracked so that they'd be able to see which liver enzymes are indicating damage and then to track them over time so they can see the effects of the specific removal of fluconazole. Okay, which liver enzymes? Okay. We're both it's usually ALT or AST, but it depends on what the doctor himself is looking at to determine that there has been a problem. Okay. If the doctor has any specific marker that he or she is looking at, then that really is the rule. But it would be ALT or AST most of the time, just if I were to have an arbitrary guess as to what they're looking at. In fact, that would be okay. something worth looking at just in previous tests to see if that's an indication of the uh, liver function. Yeah, the previous test didn't show any, any liver problems, and the last two, I think, showed that there was something going on. 
and he's been on fluconazole since 2010. Mm-hmm. Tried to get him off a year ago, and his titer went up immediately to 1 to 16 and then 1 to 32. Okay. How long has he been taking the ibuprofen as well? Uh, a, lo- a long time. He's here telling long. Yeah. Okay. So it will be really tough to separate what was caused by ibuprofen, if anything, and what was caused by the fluconazole, if anything. It's going to be the kind of thing where you'll want to keep track of which dates they were started and stopped. And then, or, of course, in this case, because he was on both for so long, it's just the date of stopping. And then you'll want to see what the tests look like from that point. Okay. All right. That's one of my questions. I'll look. Okay. Do you have another question? Well, I have other ones, but somebody else might have, too. Okay. Uh, if you like, while we're uh, in the Q&A session, I can just go to the next one, and uh, you can ask again, so we'll just try to get through everybody that we can. Okay. That'd be good. Okay. So I will click to have the next question on. Hi. Who am I speaking to? Hi, David. Uh, this is Patrick Anderman. Oh, Hi. Hi. Yeah, I was hospitalized and diagnosed back in December, and uh, I was uh, doing fairly okay until May when I developed a respiratory infection, and uh, that was a pretty significant setback. But the biggest thing is that since then, I have just been uh, experiencing just a... um, increasing amount of pain in my feet and my ankles and my lower back. I just had a follow-up with the infectious disease doctor uh, just this past week, and uh, indications were that the, I don't have a titer, um, but he said the indications were that it looked like that the valley fever was subsiding um, and that the cavity in my lung has shrunk. But he didn't, and he suspected that the, the source of the pain might be neuropathy, but he said that he didn't think that the valley fever was the cause of neur- neuropathy. I was just wondering what, what your thoughts are on that. Are there other diagnoses of other diseases that might have caused neuropathy that he has? I'm sorry? Does he, has he gone through, has your doctor diagnosed any other illnesses or causes of neuropathy that he's aware of or that, that he's made you aware of rather uh, for me yeah and, and no at this point in time they're they're I really it, it, it the source is undiagnosed at this point okay it is possible that he's correct that maybe something else did cause it it's also possible that valley fever may have caused neuropathy to cause the pains in these areas it also could be something totally unrelated i mean there's no real way to know without a firm diagnosis however sometimes uh some of these things could be contributed this would not be a cause but it's a contributor that the inactivity from valley fever sometimes causes a loss of circulation which can cause all kinds of problems in, in people, particularly limbs and back, and you're not accustomed to be able to be moving around as often as you would have, and that might make pain more severe just by not being able to be as strong in some ways as you would have been otherwise. Which is, okay. Yeah, this is not really something that's particularly helpful because once you already have that kind of problem, you have to go through physical therapy or and when I say physical therapy, it doesn't mean something where you have a diagnosis of a physical therapist, but sometimes you have to rebuild your ability to walk and to be able to uh, just continue on with day-to-day activities just by getting used to that. However, it is worth talking to the doctor about whether a physical therapy prescription might be something that you should get just to see if that does help you. Okay. But, of course, if this is a true neuropathy, it is worthwhile to know exactly what is causing it so you can perhaps take whatever type of medicine would fight the organism causing the neuropathy. And that also could even be due to some kind of trauma like a car accident or something like that if you had been in one recently. 
Yeah, I I had had a pretty severe back injury a couple of years ago, but um, I'll be seeing the pulmonologist uh, this coming week, and then the two of them will kind of compare notes and see what see what they think. And one good question to bring to your doctor is. What does the inactivity for my valley fever contribute to my back injury? Because if you already had a back injury, then just being perhaps laying down on your back or sitting down in a posture that may not be 100% perfect for your injury, that in itself could cause all kinds of problems. The spine is really important, and if there is a damage that's been there before, you definitely have to make sure it's being treated properly, especially if you're having problems that look like neuropathy. So you definitely have to talk about that. It could be that physical therapy based on whatever happened with your inactivity could do more even than any kind of uh, specific diagnosis of a microorganism. Yeah, because my inactivity level is actually pretty substantial. Um, I, I, I'm working uh, I'm working part-time, but... Um, uh, really about all I can do at this point is work part-time and then I come home and um, eat and sleep. <laughs> so, so, uh, and, uh, and, then, and then even with working part-time, Saturday is generally a, a, a lost day. I sleep all day Saturday and then sometimes most of the day Sunday. It would also be worthwhile to consider the posture you would use at work and the posture you would use at home for sitting and sleeping, that maybe those would contribute to the back pain element. I don't know necessarily what's going on to make it to foot pain and other things, but it is worth considering that just as one more way of approaching every possible question so you can get to the best answer. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay. I, uh, I hope that helps. And I will be moving to the next question. Okay, we have a speaker on Skype. Hi, who are we speaking to? Hi, this is Denise Roberts. Um, Sharon and David, I just wanted to say thank you very much for uh, starting over from the beginning and um, all of your work. So very appreciative of both of you. So my question is, um, so I've been on itraconazole for two years now, and my titer is stuck at 1 to 32. Um, I'm following the valley fever diet. I'm doing all this stuff, but um, I'm also a runner, and I run nine miles a week, and that's the one thing that I'm just not sure about, if that's helping or if it's hindering, and I was wondering if you've done any research as far as, like, what exercise would be helpful or if there's any sort of exercise that might be contributing to my titers being stuck. Well, I know that Daniel Trekia has done a master work of exercise for strength training that respects the immune system. I will repost his, uh, his book information. He was actually giving this out to the Valley Fever community because he did some research on his own. He himself is a trainer and an athlete, and in the process of his recovery, he wanted to make sure that he would perform activities that would not contribute additional stress to the immune system. Had you heard about that before, Denise? I, I have. Book. I remember seeing something about that, but I didn't actually end up getting the book. But I think um, I think I had a problem downloading it or something. But um, I will search the board for that again and see if I can get that. Well, Dave, we'll I'll post, post it again yeah, after the teleconference. Again. Okay. Just, All right. To hear your voice. Uh, thank you for, <laughs> yeah. For bearing with us through all this misery, we had no idea nobody was hearing us, and it was really very unhappy surprise to find out what has happened. So we apologize for all the inconvenience it caused everyone. Oh, well, thanks again for starting over. It's really appreciative, and I, I found a lot of the stuff really helpful, so thank you for that. Yeah, I also want to say if you feel comfortable with your running nine miles a week, and that's really great that you're doing that, I don't see anything wrong with it. If you're not exhausted afterwards that you have to sit down for an hour or longer, then I see there's absolutely nothing wrong with you doing your run. Okay, great. Yeah, my energy levels are pretty good, um, so I just wanted to make sure that wasn't 
something that was, I don't know why my titers are stuck, honestly, and it's, like, kind of frustrating. So I'm like, I'm trying everything, but just wanted to see if there was anything. But I'll I'll get the book, and I'll see if maybe there's some new exercises or a new routine I can try. Uh, are you sleeping well? Yeah, very well. I sleep about eight hours, eight, nine hours a night. Okay. And your um, stress level? Um, I mean, it's, it's probably a little higher than normal. I work in kind of a stressful environment, um, and I have three kids too, so (laughs) that probably doesn't help, but, um, but I try to, I, I do a lot of self-care and I try to, I keep, I do keep my stress levels down as best as I can. Running helps actually. Do you do any meditation? I do. I meditate every day. I have a, an app on my phone. It's called Headspace. Um, so I do meditation, um, I do yoga three times a week. Well, I would say that as long as you're doing that, you're keeping your stress level down as best as possible. Um, this is just, you know, there are 200 different, uh, there are two species, but 200 different strains. And with that in mind, we don't know which strain you have. And so your body may be just fighting this monster and will it will just take a little time to get it where it should be. But when you're doing your meditations, because being a hypnotherapist, um, med- the only difference between meditation and hypnosis is that you're actually working on something rather than just relaxing. So that's the difference between meditating and self-hypnosis. And so while you're in your meditative state, what you should be doing is envision this leaving your body, just coming out through your pores, and see it just dissipate into the air, and find yourself feeling better with every breath that you take. And do whatever words that you would find would be calming and helpful to you. And repeat this every time you go into a meditative state. And it just might help you because the mind-body connection is great. I worked with a guy who was a uh, was he a fourth or fifth degree black belt, Merlino, but whatever he was. Anyway, uh, he had tore up his knee pretty bad. It needed severe surgery. And I used to do martial arts as well. And so I got to know this guy. So I said to him, "Look, you do everything the doctors tell you to do, but work with me as well." And they said that in about nine months, he should be walking more normally, but he'll never be able to kick and do some of the techniques he used to do. Well, in nine weeks, the man was back to being where he was beforehand. Because he released what was in the cells of his body, the trauma in the cells. So in the same way, if you release whatever happened to you during your valley fever, during the whole time that you've had it, If you release that from your body that you don't hold on to it, you may find that your tides will start going down. Wow, that's really helpful, actually. Yeah, because when I meditate, I'm just, you know, getting into that meditative state, but I never actually thought of it as more like, I've been hypnotized before, but yeah, it's more of like hypnosis. Um, So yeah, actually, I'm going to start doing that now. So thank you very much for that, Sharon. I appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. I know it works. I've been doing this for over 25 years, so I know it works. So, Absolutely, yeah. So um, let me know how it goes. I will. I will, definitely. Thank you very much for that advice. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. Okay. Okay, and now we are going to go to the next in the Q&A session. Hello, you are on the Q&A. Who are we speaking with? Yes, hi, uh, my name is Siegfried. Uh, we're from uh, Chula Vista here in South Cali- Southern California. Hi. Yes, hi. Uh, my uh, nine years old son was diagnosed with valley fever uh, one and a half years ago. Uh, last year, I guess February of 2017. And then uh, he was started on fluconazole 350 until now. Uh, actually, his uh, his title started with a one one to thirty two, but then last uh, finally last month it went uh, negative. But then uh, last month uh, we did another title, 
even though with the corona soul he went back to one to two so my question is uh, is it a possibility that even though you're, you're on medication you still get a relapse i mean he was already negative three months ago and then last month the title went back to positive which is still low but still positive one is to two yeah i'm glad that things have improved as much as they have but still it's possible that there can be relapses and that it's not a straight line journey to permanent re remission i mean sometimes there are small cases of relapse or just small fluctuations in the way the titer is this is a part of the disease that it's not always 100% predictable but with the trend being lower and lower over the months i feel really optimistic that that things are better and that even if it's going up slightly just as long as it is still monitored things are probably going to be getting better in fact when is the next test scheduled yeah, actually the plan was uh, if the titer is negative uh, twice and then they have to stop the medication so right now they have to uh, monitor every three months so the next one would be September okay, yeah very far away so it'll be good to hear that things are either staying low or hopefully back to zero again uh, so that is, is, yeah, are you, is, he's not having, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. you don't have him, he's not drinking things like sodas and having a lot of sweet desserts and things like that, right? Yeah, you know, my, 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 my son is just nine years old sometimes, but he's been very nice eating veggies now, uh, included on his diet, but with regard to sodas, uh, he doesn't drink anymore compared to when he was diagnosed. But you know, sometimes you still it's a little bit sweet, but very, uh, very small amount. I don't know, uh, but you know, before he got a, uh, before uh, the last, the last titer, he was diagnosed with strep throat and he was placed on antibiotics. I don't know that could have con contributed it also, since antibiotics could, you know, could lower the immune system. Uh, yeah, anti see antibiotics kill off all the good bacteria as well as bad bacteria. And when you have antibiotics, you're making room for coxy to grow. They compete for space. So if you're killing off some of the good bacteria as well as the bad, that could be what helped him to rise up with his uh, titer again just a little bit. But it sounds like he's headed in the right direction and if he avoids all those sugary drinks, they're not going to help him one bit with coxie. Uh, and so if he could avoid that and you could um, continue to get him to eat more healthy, I think you should keep improving. And I pray that he does. Yeah. So, and David, uh, you know, hopefully he gets, uh, he, he gets the title back to zero again. So and it's gonna, we're gonna stop the medication. What would be the best? You know, I mean, uh, the how frequent should be the titer be tested when you go when you go dormant? Well, every case is different, so there is no specific time period. What we can say, Dave? I was pretty much going to say that exact same thing, but once it's down twice in a row, like your doctors were looking for, that's a very mm -hmm. good indication that it's going to be staying there. It's not facing those same kind of wild fluctuations that sometimes happen in the middle of a case where there are real symptoms going on. Yeah, actually, my, my son's been healthy. Actually, uh, his uh, latest x-ray is now normal, going back when he was initially diagnosed. They thought it was even lymphoma because uh, his uh, lymph nodes were, uh, were enlarged the parahelar and the paratracheal they even thought it was a uh, it was lymphoma so but then you know they, t they tested for uh, coxy and then he was he was a uh, diagnosed positive yeah a lot of misdiagnoses occur well i wish you and him good luck and uh uh keep letting us know how things are going for you we're here for you anytime you have questions Okay, Sharon, thank you very much, and David. Okay, thanks. And as it turns out, the Q&A session has no more questions in it. If someone does want to have additional questions, to put in pound six, 
and you'll be able to be added to the Q&A session. Uh, except it wasn't working. The pound six wasn't working. Well, pound six was that people were joining. Oh, really? Because yep. it wasn't before. Okay, it wasn't before, but the pound six actually is, okay, we're working that we have one more, and then we'll be able to uh, keep on going. Okay, we have selected the additional question. Hello, who are we speaking to, and what is your question? Okay, this is Bev Yolke again. I asked one right at the beginning. All right. I want to know... What do you know about CBD oil, oregano oil, or prolotherapy? And I spoke to somebody that talked about the biosensor, that maybe my husband could have that done. Do you have any information on any of those? Prolotherapy oh, I'm sorry, keep going. Therapy has been really recommended strongly, but we haven't done it because it's an out of out of the pocket expense insurance doesn't cover. Okay, uh, in regards to the biosensor, the one that is talked about that will be released as far as a new article in October 2018, I don't have the complete details on it. It sounds exciting, but that's just primarily for testing of antibodies. So okay. we're going to have to get more information at the time when it is available, and we won't have that now for Valley Fever for the biosensor. Okay. For prolotherapy, that is the creation of specific inflammation at a joint in order to make it so that the ligaments are able to repair themselves better and the connective tissue is able to repair itself better. Is that what you were talking about for him? Yes, yes, because he has so many joint pains and he's talked to orthopedic doctors and most of them, knowing he has valley fever, they don't want to touch him. Well, I'm not necessarily sure what the effects of the prolotherapy would be because if he's having pain directly from valley fever, that is caused to an inflammation that is already there. And prolotherapy right. in many ways is a directed, spe medically specified inflammation that is artificially created. So very often to relieve pain, we talk about having steps to reduce inflammation, which sometimes means even just psychically doing so, like reducing stress or it can mean physically doing so with specific exercise or anti-inflammatory foods. But in regards to specifically causing an inflammation to heal an area, I just do not know about that. That's sort of an unknown that would probably require a little bit more research as far as prolotherapy would go. Is there any research done as far as CBD oil uh, and valley fever, the pain from valley uh fever? Okay, it's not specifically about valley fever, but with CBD oil, it is not just one thing. It is a combination of many compounds that are able to have many different effects. And the problem with that is that a pharmacy, for example, is full of many compounds that, that have many different effects. A pharmacy could have antifungal medicines. It could have antibacterial antibiotics, and it could have aspirin and headache medicines. But you wouldn't take every single thing in a pharmacy because there's just too many different drugs that could cause a really bad reaction. And in the same way, the CBD oil causes a lot of different things. So we've had people who've tried it who've told us everything from, it cured me, I'm perfect, everything is great, to I'm now in the hospital and it's terrible, and then some people had no side effects. So until there's more research to know what compound is going to be, have the most strong result in a specific person for that specific person's specific symptoms, it is something that's very difficult for me to talk about. The primary thing that happens is pain relief when people talk about that in other ailments, but as far as valley fever is concerned, I just don't have enough information and there just isn't enough research to say which component is going to cause the best aspects from it. Okay. One concern that I have is that very often with some marijuana-derived treatments, they talk about how great it is for people who have autoimmune diseases because it shuts down parts of the immune system and therefore stops the autoimmune disease in its tracks. That would be bad for someone with valley fever because what you want is an immune system that is as strong as possible to be able to shut down valley fever. So if that case that is so frequently studied as a part of cannabis, cannabis is like a whole pharmacy, as I said, so there's so many different things that it can do. I don't know if the antifungal components are stronger than the immune-reducing components, 
and under what circumstances they would be. So that's my big concern with CBD oil. It's sort of an unknown insofar as a particular type of case and how it would react. Okay, that's what I was afraid of because we don't know what's in it. Okay. Um, and I recently... You also asked about oil of oregano. Oh, yeah. And that is quite frequently spoken about as an antifungal in the same way that people talk about garlic being something that's antifungal. But so far, it just doesn't look like that is something that specifically causes benefits for valley fever. There aren't any uh, specific research in medical journals that compare oil of oregano with valley fever, but it's, uh, it's just not something that we have right there to be able okay, to Okay, and what is, the, what is the silver silver what that they talk about? And it's been on the valley fever support site. Oh, uh, are you talking about, uh, I guess a couple of months ago somebody had mentioned colloidal silver? Yes, that's it. Mm-hmm. The reason why I don't think colloidal silver would work in valley fever is because people take colloidal silver to ingest silver nanoparticles in the hopes it will go through the bloodstream and then ultimately be directed to the molecules of valley fever that are available at other parts of the body. But what happens is that when they were taking some of the photography of valley fever, the microscopic photography, in order to take better pictures, they have silver nanoparticles that they wash the fungus with. And if it's in a Petri dish where the microscopic particles are completely washed with these silver nanoparticles, that's going to be a much higher dose of silver nanoparticles than whatever is going to filter through the bloodstream from somebody's dose at a particular time and to hit a particular part of the body through circulation. So if that were the case, that silver nanoparticles were able to destroy this fungus, then I would think that the photography method would be something that destroys the fungus. Instead, it just takes clear pictures. Oh, that, that makes sense. Because back in 2010, before Leroy was put on amphotericin B, he had lymph nodes removed from under his arm, and they asked, they came and asked if they could use those in textbooks on valley fever, if, if I'd grant them permission, permission to use pictures of those. So, so I did, hoping it helped somebody else understand valley fever. And I, too, appreciate what you and Sharon have done, and I have recommended your book to many people that have gotten valley fever or are questioning if a, a loved one has gotten valley fever. So thank, thank you, you for much. all that you put into this. We really appreciate both of you. Uh, I'm very glad to hear that. We want to be able to put this information in as many hands as possible so there can be as much healing as possible wherever it can be. And thank you for sticking uh, around for this nightmare today. It was just Unbelievable shocking to find out that nobody heard us when we started at 2 o'clock right on time. And that uh, this, this service is not quite what we were hoping it would be. In fact, I have someone right now who wanted to do that, but she said the pound six won't work since the number is invalid. Oh. That's very strange. Is that is that person on the teleconference right now? I believe so. I believe she's still there. Okay, if anyone else would like to have questions, you can try pound six to try to get in one more time to try for any other further questions. Okay, the person who was writing online can hear me, but apparently can't get in. Oh, wait a minute. Why don't you, since uh, I'm looking at the screen right now, maybe type your question and I'll be able to read it for the group and answer it. In this case, this person is uh, listening to the teleseminar, for those of you who aren't on, but is not able to use the pound six option to ask a question. It doesn't have the indication of typing a message at this point. So we are, um, she will be typing her question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I went on Facebook and um, uh this did not go as smoothly as we had hoped. Uh, I hope that anybody who 
hasn't looked at our files tab to see the information that we have on inflammatory foods, what to eat, what not to eat, as far as that goes. And in there, we also have a PDF on the basic foods list. I hope you'll do that as well. And once our website is up, a uh, new website, it is going to be so helpful. Uh, I know that uh, we're very excited about it, and we can't wait to be able to share it with everyone. So while I'm just waiting for uh, Catelli to write her um, question, uh, is there anybody else there that has a question that maybe can get through on pound six? Doesn't look like it. But we're going to also try to do so, just to let you know, is that we're going to try to put up a um, copy of the teleconference that we did so that for people who came back late after we started it all over again and were kind enough to stay on when we had all these technical issues, that uh, they will all get to be able to see what they missed and hear it from the beginning. It may take a little while for it to get into that format, but we will do that for sure. So I hope uh, those that did hear it found that it was useful. And there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and that's the most important thing to know. There always is a light at the end of the tunnel. It's not over till it's over. I just recently heard from someone, um, this lady's husband, who had left, uh, well, I should say she had been with us for a long time, and I lost track of her, and he wrote and told me that she lost her battle. And um, there are people that do, but more people don't, and that's the thing to hold dear is that more people don't lose the battle. So, okay, so I will read off my screen. I was finally diagnosed in January 2018. My titles were 1 to 128 in March, 132 in July, 1 to 8. Well, that's much better. My question is, when will this swelling finally subside? It's gotten a lot better, but not completely gone. And she was very kind and says, thank you for everything. I thank you for being here, and I thank you for understanding our issues today. Well, one of the things I'd like to say is that very often it could take up to a, a year after things subside before people really feel a lot better. And if you are following a lot of our, our diet recommendations, the more you do that and the more you get to be able to start exercising again, the better you will start feeling. Uh, as I mentioned once, the gut is your second brain. So by having been on all these drugs, you're killing your gut floor. That happens with any drug that you take. So by using probiotics, that is the best way to start getting your gut floor back in balance. And when your gut floor is back in balance, it helps to get you in balance. So if you uh, are following uh, any of our recommendations, great. If you haven't done that much with it, I, if you told me once before, and forgive me if I don't remember because I deal with so many people, but uh, if you haven't, please do that. If you have any questions on food, please let us know. And I promise you that you're in the right direction. Getting down to 1 to 8 sounds really great. Uh, the fact that you still have inflammation, make sure that you think about avoiding all inflammatory foods and drinking enough. Uh, fluid intake is vital, especially if you're uh, not well, if you're on any kind of medications, and uh, in general. Fluid is very important intake. And that doesn't mean just water. You can have teas, uh, ginger tea, dandelion tea, roy boy tea, uh, things of that nature. 
uh, rosemary tea, which is good. You know, that's an interesting thing I didn't get to mention before. Rosemary tea. You could take even uh, the needles of rosemary, and you can put it in boiling water and to make rosemary tea. And there's actually been studies done that taking rosemary helps with memory, uh, a sharpness and alertness, and so you might even want to try that to help with anybody who has those kind of issues. Um, I'm glad to see it's gotten a lot better for you, um, but unfortunately this disease takes its time and goes on its own timetable. So I really believe you're heading in the right direction and can either continue doing some of the the same things with foods or start doing more with that, and I think everything is going to uh, continue going down and you'll get it dormant. So I, I see that she's about to write some more. You're very welcome. We're glad that uh, you were able to stay with us and bear with us through this whole thing. And as it turns out from the software, it says that someone also has pressed pound six to be able to be in the Q&A session. So I'm going to press the button and welcome to uh, the Q&A session. Please say who I'm speak who you are and your question. Hi. Hi, David. It's Patrick once again. Oh, hi. I I, I just had another question. Um, we had watched a documentary uh, program not too long ago, and it had to do with. Um, Super bugs in hospitals, and they were talking about how they were um, now using copper to kill these super viruses. Do you know if there has been any um, any, any any research into if that also is effective in treating uh, fungus like like the valley fever? I have not specifically heard of using metals as part of any kind of antifungal surface to fight valley fever. It's not necessarily something that's hospital transmitted unless it's in something like a case where there are spores released from a lab. There was even a case where there was this poor young girl who had a cast where there was a lesion from valley fever. And what happened is that the lesion itself was expanding and leaking and going onto the cast. So the cast was growing a colony of spores on it. When they opened that cast, the spores became airborne, and many people on that floor and people in the room happened to have been infected because of the cast. But as far as anything that would be a surface cleaner, that wouldn't necessarily be possible because of things that people could walk outside the hospital and become infected if it's something like that. So unless it's one of those kinds of isolated circumstances, it probably would not help with valley fever. However, the Biomet technology with the VT1161, the new drug that may be able to have far fewer side effects, what's interesting is that they, they were able to build that drug by using metalloenzymes. So they're specifically looking at the metal within the enzymes that allow the fungus to function. And then by targeting that particular enzyme and learning how to knock it out, that is the way that they're able to fight against valley fever as a drug. So it isn't a, a concern inside the hospital, but they are using metals in that way. It's definitely not the same as the copper technology that you were looking at, though, that you had mentioned. Yeah, I was thinking of it more as uh, like the potential of perhaps taking like a copper supplement to try and help. Uh, try and help the, the valley fever to go dormant. Well, certainly it is an essential nutrient that you want to have your body have all the required nutrition that you should have to be able to deal with anything during the day. Yeah, we have uh, one of the things that we'll have on our page, a source for a lot of different items, will be one uh, supplement, which is what I consider like as a one a day, but it's much better than any one a day type of supplements out there. Anyway, uh, it will have a lot of different minerals in it as well, uh, but you don't want to take high doses of copper. You want just the standard of what would be put in there. 
But there's a lot of things like CO210 and PQQ, which work on uh, your mitochondria. And if you build up your mitochondria, that helps you fight things off and to stay healthy. People die when they no longer have CO210 in their body. So the more you keep things at an optimal level by taking supplements with that, you, you can accomplish a lot. And PQQ is fairly new, and I've been taking that now for quite some time. It is, I think, one of the things I would never do without because of what it can do for you. Can you explain that a little bit, Dave? PQQ is kind of interesting, and I cannot pronounce the full name of this molecule. They just abbreviate it as PQQ. However, uh, what it really does that's nice is it helps to energize the mitochondria. These are cellular power plants. Mitochondria are great, that they are within each individual cell in order to make sure that it has the power it needs to keep the cell running. If you need to oxidize energy to get things going, to get energy uh, building up for you, PQQ probably is the number one compound that your cells are going to be needing in order to make that happen. So it's nice that people can take it as a supplement and to perhaps feel more energetic. Because there's the idea of energy being fuel, but then that would just be the food itself. But this is what helps mobilize the compounds within your body to use it as energy, which is perhaps even more important than just having the fuel of the food in the first place. You need to be able to utilize it. Yeah, PQQ goes along with CO2-10, but um, not all CO2-10 and not all PQQ are equal. And so uh, if you... if you were interested in the ones that I take and what I would recommend uh, if you wanted to find out if it's okay for them to take these, then um, I could just write it to you, send you either on Facebook, you know, in a message or on the Facebook page itself, which one so you could take a look at it and see what you want to do with this doctor. Yeah, I would really appreciate that because I'd be interested in looking into that. Okay, so why don't you message, if you wouldn't mind, message that to me, you know, so that um, I don't want to forget to do that. So if you message me, I'll be able to get to do that right, or, you know, sooner than later. Okay. I will. Thank you so much. And okay, you're as, welcome. As others have stated, I very much appreciate all your help and all the work that, and effort that you've put into helping out all of us with this. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's very much appreciated hearing that as well. Is there anybody else there, or is that it? And the Q&A session is officially done. Uh, I really want to thank everyone who has been hanging on for this. You all have the patience of a saint for having to uh, put up with some of what's been going on with the teleseminar software and having the massive delay that was here. But I'm really glad I was able to get the information to you, particularly since there was such a delay to actually be able to at least conclude it, to get it done and out there. And uh, I hope it was worthwhile, and I hope we'll continue to be doing worthwhile work for you. So we're going to be closing this up now, and I uh, did what David said. Uh, Thank you all for coming, and I hope this has been helpful to all of you. Bye. Okay, bye, everybody.